Um, I, I just wanted to give you some sense of the, the, the context in which remittances figure in Africa as a source of external finance. So in contrast to most of the rest of the world, in particular Latin America and Southeast Asia, uh, remittances haven't yet overtaken aid flows in Africa. This is the aid flow here. Yeah, you see the remittance flow down here. Uh, remittances are also uh, lower than private capital of direct foreign investment in Africa. Uh, there has been a, a small uptick in the level of transfer over the past year. So it's now running at about 32 billion. Um, and you can see it just for purposes of comparison. This is uh, private portfolio investment, equity investment. And as you can see, it's pretty volatile. And the remittance transfers aren't volatile. So that, that just gives you a sort of sense of the, the, the scale of the resource flows that we're talking about. If you look at it as a proportion of regional GDP, it's about 2% of GDP. And of course, the level of the transfer relative to GDP varies enormously across the region. So Nigeria is by far the biggest recipient. But in countries like uh, Lesotho, Senegal, and others, it's a far bigger share of GDP. Mm -hmm. So you, the, this, this is a significant flow of resources that we're talking about. I'm going to hand over to Maria just to take us through yeah. the first part of, uh, of the report. Sure, thanks, thanks Kevin. Right, so Kevin, as Kevin stated, remittances are rising. They are increasing steadily. <coughs> and in 2013, uh, they were about uh, 32 billion US dollars, remittances to Sub-Saharan Africa only. So why are remittances <coughs> important? Uh, well, they are important at the <coughs> micro level and at the macro level. At the micro level, at the household level, remittances are a source of funds finance <coughs> to invest in human capital, that is uh, education, health, but also to invest in <coughs> agriculture, to buy a plot of <coughs> land, uh, and uh, as well to start uh, a new business. Uh, they are definitely an insurance against food insecurity. Uh, so they help households uh, to cope with emergencies. At the macro level, uh, we've got similar benefits. Uh, they increase uh, foreign exchange reserves, uh, they help uh, to cover current account deficits, uh, and they are uh, counter-cyclical. Just uh, think about the role of remittances during the 2009 crisis, food crisis in Somalia, and famine in Somalia. Remittances reach the country much quicker than foreign aid. So, uh, if remittances are so important, uh, why is African paying a tax, a remittance super tax, and what is a remittance super tax? So first of all, we considered the global average, the global average cost uh, that is paid by the diaspora all around the world to send money back home, and that is around 7.88%. Then we considered other regions, say Latin America and Caribbean and South Asia, and you see they are below the average cost. So they help the average to stay low. And they are actually decreasing. They are decreasing and they are moving towards the 5 by 5 initiative, the 5% target that was set in 2008 by the G8 summit. But what surprised us really is uh, what Africans are paying to send money back home, that is around 12%. It's not decreasing, as you're seeing there, it's kind of stable around that 12 percent uh, and is pushing the average cost uh, far above uh, the 5 percent target. Now we didn't stop there, we wanted to compute then the loss uh, that that cost implies. So first of all we compared uh, the Sub-Saharan African cost uh, with the global average cost excluding Sub-Saharan Africa and the cost, uh, the, the loss uh, is around 1.4 billion dollars. If you compare the African cost uh, to the 5 by 5 initiative, the loss becomes $2.3 billion, which is huge, it's massive. On average, the mid-range figure is $1.8 billion. So you can tell me, so, okay, $1.8 million, it's a financial figure. So, so what? Well, behind that $1.8 million, there are human beings. So that $1.8 million corresponds to 14 million children that could be enrolled in primary education, that is half the number of children that are out of school in Africa. That 1.8 corresponds to 21 million 
people that can be provided with clean water, or 8 million people that can be provided with sanitation, improved sanitation. So there is far, far much, uh, so much below that, that figure. Okay, so <coughs> then we said, okay, so <coughs> let's, let's have a look at the market then. Why are the costs so high? Let's consider the markets. I need technical help, maybe. Or just a clear thing. Shall I start with the presentation now? This is um, definitely Western Union and MoneyGram yeah. <laughs> <laughs> behaving badly. Yeah. <laughs> so we consider the share of payout locations by type of provider and uh, we took uh, payout locations as a proxy of market share. Data are from IFAD, the UN agency. So we said, okay, let's see, um, post office, banks and others are covering around 11% of the, of the market and 89% uh, of the market is actually covered by money transfer operators. But the story is not that because Behind that 89%, uh, there are mainly two companies. Uh, Western Union, that is covering 40% of the market. MoneyGram, that is covering 24% of the market. So <coughs> two-thirds of the market covered by money transfer operators is controlled uh, by Western Union and MoneyGram. All the rest, uh, well, other money transfer operators and smaller ones uh, that are trying to enter a non-competitive market. And of course, they are challenged by the lack of possibilities. Much of Africa is a duopoly, so that was a general feature for Africa. Then we went into details and we analyzed each and every African country. We started with two countries, Gabon and Liberia. Now in Gabon, 98% of the market is covered by Western Union. In Liberia, similar, a similar figure, 97, is covered by MoneyGram. So they are monopolizing in a way the market. Mm -hmm. but if you have a look at all other African countries, the two companies uh, are sharing, in a way, the control of the market. So for 22 African countries, either Western Union or MoneyGram are controlling more than half of the market. For another 11 countries, the two companies together are controlling more than half of the market. And I'll just ask Kevin to continue. Thank you. Yeah, Shall I? Great. Sorry, this is the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an easy, easy mistake to make. Um, could you click on the next one? Sure. Yeah. So ba basically, and, and this has been a, a source of some contention, as a lot of you may have gathered, with MoneyGram <laughs> and Western Union, because we, we wanted to ask a basic question. You know, if these losses are real money losses, where do they go? Like, you know, what happens in the intermediation chain to divert these resources from African people um, into the money transfer network? And, and what proportion of these losses can be traced back to the big money transfer operators? And I don't want to go into the technical details on this that you'll find in the annex for the report, but we basically did a, um, a lower bound and an upper bound estimate. So the lower bound was we took the reported charges of the money transfer operators against the benchmark of the global average. And we said, look, you know, if you, if you take that difference, what does it look like? And that comes to around 365 million of the overall loss. The other way of doing it, which intuitively is more obvious, and I suspect more accurate, although we can't prove it, is a pure market share approach. That, you know, if you account for two thirds of the market share, other things being equal, it could be argued you're likely to account for two thirds of the implied loss that we estimate. That will push the figure up to around 807 million. So we've taken this mid-range figure as a sort of indicative loss of around 586 million associated with the operations of the two major agencies that uh, Maria mentioned, MoneyGram and Western Union. Um, it, in, in terms of understanding the drivers of these high charges, of course, as I said at the outset, there are some enormously, shall I just take it right here? Sure. Okay. There are some enormously complicated issues involved, but what it comes down to <coughs> is a lack of competition in the marketplace. And uh, you, you saw from the graph on Africa that in most countries, you really just have two providers that are dominating the payout locations. But what's interesting, and I think this merits further research, even in countries where 
both of those operators figure quite prominently. They often operate in geographically quite distinctive areas, so they don't compete very directly with each other, uh, even in countries where they both have a presence in many cases. Um, m many African governments um, and regulatory authorities have now identified restrictive business practices on the part of money transfer operators um, and their associates in Africa as a major source um, of higher prices. And in particular, there are, there are two arrangements. One is exclusivity agreements with banks, whereby the big money transfer operators will strike a deal with the bank that they will act as a payout agent for them, but for no other money transfer operator. Uh, and similarly, with their own agents on the ground, there'll be agreements that those agents will not be permitted <coughs> to work with or for other money transfer operators. Now, you know, of course, there are, there, you know, there are difficult balances to strike here, but this is clearly an arrangement that restricts new entry into the marketplace. Um, I, I just wanted to put up this quote from the Competition Commission in Gambia to illustrate this point, where they concluded the leading providers of money transfer services are exploiting the monopoly situation that is restrictive and anti-competitive in nature. Um, there's a lack of transparency on foreign exchange costs, and I want to come back to this in a moment. But I think if any of you in this room who remit money back to Africa might be aware that it's very hard to find in an accessible form the real charge that you're incurring as a result of foreign currency conversion fees. So the flat rate fees are usually very transparently communicated. It's not the case with the foreign currency conversion charge. One of the points that the money transfer operators and banks, of course, make is that the increasingly stringent re reporting requirements on them as a result of anti-money laundering um, requirements and um, anti-terrorism requirements do require greater investment in <coughs> due diligence. And I'm sure that is a factor that drives up charges as well. Um, lastly, Africa's banking regulations are, are a problem in this area because there's a requirement in many countries that only banks are permitted to do remittance payouts um, rather than microfinance institutions. M m most Africans with a link to the financial system are linked through microfinance institutions, not banks. And African banks do have notoriously high intermediation charges. So the link between the money transfer operators, which are highly concentrated, and the banks, which are uncompetitive, is, is part of the problem. And of course, financial exclusion in Africa itself is a problem because when people don't have accounts where they have to travel long distances to reach payout agents, it, uh, it, it drives up costs. Now, um, we, we, we wanted to try and get behind the headline numbers and re you know, really understand what, you know, what it is in the operations of companies like MoneyGram and Western Union that result in these high fees that we document um, in the report. And as some of you will have picked up from the, from the press this morning and some of the radio and TV stuff that's been going on, this has become quite a contentious area. And we have had very long and laborious discussions with Western Union in b before we put the paper out. Um, but I want to just give you, first of all, an example of what the charge structure looks like. Now, in our discussions with Western Union, they were at pi they're, they're, they're one of their core arguments was that you're oversimplifying here. You're, re you know, you're reducing things to simple numbers in what are enormously complicated markets, very diverse products, uh, and differentiated remittance corridors. And so just to give you an, an illustration of what these corridors look like, um, the typical charge has a fixed rate fee um, and, a f and a charge that occurs as a result of the spread on the foreign currency conversion. In other words, the difference between the rate that the money transfer operator provides to a customer and the interbank rate that the money transfer operators can secure for themselves. So for Zambia, the um, fixed rate charge is 8%. Now, you'd think in what Western Union itself describes as highly complex and differentiated markets, there would be highly complicated and differentiated charging structures. But instead, what you get is a flat rate applied across the whole of Africa, 
apparently with no regard at all to underlying financial conditions. You know, that Sierra Leone is the same as, uh, as Kenya. You know, I, I, I leave it to you to make your, your own mind up on that one. Um, if you look at the spread, uh, sorry, this is the fixed rate fee for some comparator countries. If you look at the spreads, the, 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 this is what you get. So for Gambia, out of a 14% charge, six percentage points of that are incurred through the foreign, foreign currency conversion fee. Um, so that the, these are Western Union figures. Um, these are the figures that we pulled down for MoneyGram um, in March, at the end of March. Uh, we sent them to MoneyGram and asked them if they could explain to us the structure of the charges and the reasons for the difference between their charges and the structure of Western Union's charges. Uh, what we discovered when we downloaded the same data again uh, a few days ago was that they'd actually reduced the fixed rate component down to Western Union levels, which without wanting to claim that we're producing benefits for Africa, I, I, uh, I, you know, I hope this is an example of research making some difference. It's still way above uh, world average charges. Um, so, uh, so, that, so that's the picture as far as the operators are concerned. Uh, what, what are the key policy recommendations in the report? You know, it, it seems to me that action by financial regulators is long overdue in this area, in remittance sending countries, uh, agencies like the Financial Conduct Authority in the US, the Federal Reserve in the UK. We don't allege in the report any sort of cartel type behavior or formal price fixing, but there clearly are concerns about restrictive business practices, and they need to be investigated properly to ensure that consumers are getting a fair deal. We actually need much more transparent provisions on foreign currency conversion charges. In the Dodd-Frank legislation that um, one hopes will be enacted in the United States, there's a provision requiring money transfer operators to publicize on their websites the, the spread rate. In other words, not just the conversion rate, but the spread rate. And I think that's a principle that should be applied uniformly across all um, jurisdictions. Many African governments are starting now to reconsider and in some cases revoke uh, the exclusivity agreements that money transfer operators have with commercial banks um, and agents. So Gambia is stopping the practice. The Central Bank of Nigeria has stopped the practice. The Central Bank of uh, Tunisia has ruled that all banks have to offer services from two or more money transfer operators. And you know, these are all positive steps because they're increasing competition in the market. And if you don't increase competition, you're not going to see the benefits of new technology and lower prices coming through. We actually think there's a really strong case, and I, and I realize there are difficult <coughs> regulatory issues here in Africa, um, which His Excellency may, may address after as well. Um, but I actually think there's a very strong case for microfinance institutions in Africa to play an expanded role as payout locations, because this could help to drive down the costs relative to banks. And finally, you know, it seems to us that, that industry and government really have a shared interest in um, facilitating the entry of mobile remittance service delivery systems that could push down costs in the same way that M-Pesa has in domestic banking in, in Africa. So um, thank you. I'm going to leave it there. Dennis, thank you very much.